About two and a half years ago, a group of Muslim Americans proposed to build an Islamic center in New York City. Within a few months, the protests began. One sign read, no 9-11 Victory Mosque. Another sign said, all I need to know about Islam, I learned on 9-11. However, it was two other signs that caught my attention. The first was directed at the head of the project. Iman Rauf, do not lecture us about religious tolerance. Our Judeo-Christian values give you freedom. The second seemed directed at Muslims in general. This is not your country. Seeing this, I asked myself, aren't these protesters missing the point of tolerance? Indeed, as a philosopher, I asked, what is the point of tolerance? Well, the word tolerance itself comes from the Latin tolerantia, meaning the ability to bear pain. Or its more contemporary usage, tolerance means the willingness to bear the existence of the unagreeable. So perhaps the protesters did need a reminder that tolerance begins with pain and suffering and ends with bearing the existence of opinions and behaviors with which they do not agree. Indeed, tolerance presumes a tripartite distinction between first, the acceptable and the agreeable, the stuff you like, I like ice cream. Second, the things you don't accept but will tolerate, broccoli. Finally, the things you don't accept and will not tolerate, cauliflower. <laughs> The protesters forgot this middle ground. They suggest you only tolerate what you already like. Nonsense. You can only tolerate what you don't like. Again, if you like ice cream like me, you like ice cream, I can tell. Uh, it makes no sense then that you're going to tolerate ice cream. So getting back to my initial question, what is the point of tolerance, we might instead ask, why should I tolerate what I don't like? One currently fashionable answer comes from the so-called realists in political science. An exemplar of this view appears in a recent book by Wendy Brown called Regulating Aversion. In sum, Wendy Brown maintains that tolerance is governmentality. Now, governmentality was a word coined by the philosopher Michel Foucault to refer to how a government tries to produce citizens that will act on and fulfill that government's policies. According to Wendy Brown, this means that tolerance enforces hierarchy. That is, she argues, and I quote, tolerance iterates the normalcy of the powerful and the deviance of the marginal. Discourses of tolerance inevitably act on behalf of hegemonic social or political powers. Well, perhaps the protesters had read Wendy Brown's book because the protesters suggest that the real Americans will tolerate Muslims living in their communities, but Muslims will not have the same privilege given to Christians and Jews, for instance, when it comes to where they can pray. So outright prejudice on this view is supposed to be tolerant. This thought profoundly disturbs me and vividly suggests that governmentality is a dead end for tolerance. First of all, governmentality is cynical and dystopian because it presumes that tolerance is reducible to self-interest and power. I also suspect that Big Brother from 1984 would find great delight and amusement with the idea that intolerance is tolerance. Furthermore, governmentality is not egalitarian. It presumes a hierarchy where the powerful dictate the terms of tolerance and the weak are forced to accept them. This means that governmentality is arbitrary because it bases tolerance solely on the whims of the powerful. If those in power feel weak, they very well, what may well tolerate a lot. Even so, should they gain more power, feel more comfortable, they may well be very less kind. Finally, governmentality is implausible because it, it is unlikely, if not already impossible, that a single hegemonic faction has the power to set the terms of tolerance for our increasingly interconnected and pluralistic planet. In sum, an alternative conception of tolerance is necessary. Fortunately, history provides us with three I think, reasonable alternatives, all three of which were forged in the fires of religious persecution in 17th century Europe. The first of these comes from the philosopher Thomas Hobbes. During his lifetime, Hobbes witnessed three English civil wars, a Scottish civil war, as well as the Irish Confederate wars. He saw how war tore apart the British Isles as powerful religious factions each sought to be the one and only hegemonic force unifying Britain. Hobbes thought if there was to be peace between these different factions, they must tolerate one another. In particular, he thought that tolerance 
is mutual compromise. Unlike governmentality, mutual compromise is a reciprocal relationship where each side must give up something. I will give up enforcing my views on you and tolerate your beliefs and opinions, but then you must likewise do the same for me. Unlike governmentality, this view is not hierarchical. Instead, tolerance is between equals, though powerful equals. According to Hobbes, intolerance is an act of war. It is done by those unwilling to compromise and those who would rather break the peace and try to dominate others through force. While, uh, while mutual compromise is better than governmentality, mutual compromise is not fully egalitarian. Those without power will have nothing to give up and so can be safely excluded by the other groups. Indeed, while Christian factions, say Protestants and Catholics, might eventually tolerate each other, the relatively powerless Jews and Muslims would not often get the same benefits. Mutual compromise is also fragile because it requires that all the parties recognize each other as equals with respect to power. But if one party thinks it has enough power to dominate, it may cast aside tolerance and strive to establish its own hegemonic order. The second of the three views I wanted to talk about recognize this. This view comes from John Locke, another English philosopher, who, when he saw firsthand the fragility of mutual compromise. During the wars of religion in Europe, Locke became aware of a common pattern that would occur. First, civil war and massacre would be followed by peace and mutual compromise. For instance, the Edict of Nantes ended conflict between Catholics and Protestants in France, signed by uh, Henri IV of France. However, such a compromise would usually be abandoned once one party felt it had the upper hand. Indeed, the Edict of Nantes was later revoked by uh, what is it, Louis XIV of France, and it now became legal at the time for Catholics to forcibly convert and persecute Protestants. Seeing this, Locke responded that tolerance is not a compromise. Tolerance is mutual respect. Locke argued that true religious faith was something a person must freely choose and not accept by force or by the sword or the fire. So tolerance is respect that free-thinking human beings show each other. Notice, this is not a compromise. No one is giving up anything. Indeed, everyone is getting exactly what they're owed, respect. Tolerance, therefore, is between autonomous equals. I must accept that you are capable of making your own decisions, and I will tolerate that. However, you must likewise do the same for me. On the other hand, Locke thought that intolerance was paternalism. That is, intolerance amounts to treating an adult like a child, claiming that this adult is not capable of making their own decisions. Now that is disrespectful. According to Locke, as long as others are not harming you or your property, you must respect the other people's decisions and not interfere like an overanxious parent. Now I think we're on the right track to the real point of tolerance, even though I do have some remaining concerns. First of all, mutual respect is abstract because it, its talk of autonomy, freedom, may too blithely unmoor our identities from their social contexts and traditions. This suggests that mutual respect is sterile because it cannot provide a society with truly thick social bonds that will prevent it from disintegrating into comp competing religious and cultural factions. The third and final view I want to address takes this into account. It finds inspiration in the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau when he asserts that it is impossible to live with people whom one believes are damned. As I understand him here, his concern is that the threats of instability and persecution will always remain if different religions and cultural groups believe that the others are fundamentally in error. This is why I advocate a form of tolerance as mutual recognition. This begins with recognizing the basic mystery of human existence. As far as I know, there is no single agreed upon truth of how to live a human life, nor is there a single agreed upon true path to salvation. Furthermore, tolerance is recognizing that each of us is equally committed to our own personal individualized way of life. I am committed to the life of the philosopher. I suspect no one else in this room is. That's okay. I forgive you. Uh, but that doesn't mean I think that I'm superior to you all. I am not the philosopher king, though if you hear anyone's hiring, I might know someone. Uh. Now what unifies all of us 
is our commitment to live our own lives and find meaning, truth, and salvation in our own ways. This is why tolerance is between committed individuals. Each of us is passionately committed to our own lives, and yet each of us is capable of recognizing the value in other alternative ways of life. You might not desire to be a Hindu, a Buddhist, a Muslim, a Catholic, a Jew, or an atheist, but you can still recognize the value of each of these ways of life has to the Hindu, the Buddhist, the Muslim, the Catholic, the Jew, and the atheist. Each of these ways of life is valuable in its own way. Each of them a person can find meaning and fulfillment and perhaps salvation in. Contrary to this, intolerance is fundamentalism, pure and simple, for it is the fundamentalists who claim privileged access to the truth, the one, absolute one way of life, and they believe this gives them power over the rest of us to dominate us and bend us to their will. It is this type of certitude about Islam that we see in the protesters in New York City. They refuse to recognize the value that a Muslim finds in his or her own way of life and how that faith ought to be practiced. Instead, we must cast aside fundamentalism and accept the inevitable complexity, variety, tentiveness, and incompleteness in our attempts to live a good human life. Yes, mutual respect is utopian. It demands a lot from each of us, especially when we reflect upon it. But I believe the values for sustaining a richly pluralistic world should strive for or less if we are to move beyond homogeny, hierarchy, compromise, and sterility. Thank you very much.